that pre-season tour will be really interesting and a good gauge for him to realise just how big Manchester United are because when David Moyes came in, United also went to Thailand and then went on to Australia the same as this year. And, and, and David didn't really appreciate how big United were. And probably the best example of that was when they were in Sydney, he said, let's go and train on the beach. And United Security said, no, that, that, that's a bad idea. And we, we did it with Everton and there were no problems. And then doing it with Manchester United was, was very different. And even though United have been poor, I think down in Australia, there's going to be huge, huge crowds there. There's going to be 95,000 people. And to be fair, Liverpool had 95,000 after they finished seventh in 2014 when they played in Melbourne. So there, there are some parallels there. And I think it'll, it'll, it'll dazzle Ten Hag when he goes to Thailand and he realises that the players can barely leave their, their hotel floor because Manchester United are so big. And you can take that in two ways. You can think, wow, I'm impressed by this because it is impressive, that sort of Beatlemania. Or you can be daunted by it. And he's got to have the personality, which I think he does have. And I've said it too many times now, but the best game I've seen in the last few years was Eric Ten Hag's young Ajax team against Real Madrid when they were winning everything in the Bernabeu. So he's not going to be phased by the biggest stage. Unfortunately for him, it doesn't look like Manchester United will be on the biggest uh, stage next season. But I think there'll be patience among uh, the fans to... They just need to see evidence that the corner's being turned. They just need to see that he's got a clearer idea. And if that means turning down the equivalent of a Cristiano Ronaldo, if he's offered to United, I think the fans will go for that. I think the fans need a change in direction. I think they're tired of the way Manchester United have recruited. And this roller coaster of wow we've just signed Bastian Feinsteiger this fantastic world class name and then he doesn't work out and then the same with Angel de Maria we're not going to go too deeply into Ronaldo on this one but if he comes in and then signs some players who no one's ever heard of I think there'll be some patience for that okay right you're the man this is this is this is your blank sheet now um of course it's never truly blank because there are players who are contracted I think some United fans at the moment would get rid of absolutely every single player who, who's there. It's not going to work like that. There's going to be three or four going out, three or four coming in. Those numbers may go up or, up or down. And again, he's got a really, really tough job. I just don't want United fans to get carried away now. And I see these images of him looking all gladiatorial on social media as though he's done it and he hasn't done anything yet. The hard work for him starts now once he's hopefully uh, had a happy ending to his Ajax career. OK, before we go any further, I think we need to address the elephant in the room or the elephant that's not in the room. Um, <laughs> it's not going to be Mauricio Pochettino again, is it, Laurie? Um, Jack Pitbrook's written about it. What next for Poch? Uh, and to be honest, his opening line sums it up. It seemed to make so much sense, but it's not Poch again. Always the bridesmaid, it feels like. Uh, yeah. I mean, how many times is this now? You know, it was... 2016 when Fergie We're going to refer to the meal again, yeah, aren't yeah. we? <laughs> Scott's Mayfair. Yeah. <laughs> we should go to Scott's in Mayfair and have a talk of the devils from there or something. Quite, quite might be quite a high expenses bill. Um, yeah, it, I mean, how many times has it happened? You know, then you look at when Ollie first got the job and, you know, this, um, there was that uh, meeting, wasn't there, around the M25 between a certain United executive and, and Richard Pochettino and then, you know, Ollie went on his run and he didn't get it and then even in the summer, though, people were calling for it and then in November... Uh, when he left Tottenham, people were calling for it. When Ole Gunnar Solskjaer got sacked, he was, he was getting good. So it's been, I don't know, five or six times now. And I think if you're taking the poll that Gary Neville put out about fans' preference between him and Eric Ten Hag at any point prior to March, which is when this search was going on, um, it would have been a bit different. But yeah, um, he's you know, Jack's got a really good piece there. He knows um, the situation around Mitchell Pochettino really well. Um, it's an interesting one with the PSG dynamic being what it is. You know... I wonder if they would would have been more open to seeing to, to letting him go to Manchester United because it was very much beforehand a case of them wanting to save face and not being seen to have a manager poach from them. But you know if they've decided that he's not for them, then you know it's more of a palatable situation, isn't it? That being said, as, as David honestly mentioned, it was a trickier uh, exit, I suppose, to negotiate than it is at Ajax, where it's you know a kind of mature situation where they understand that people move on. Um, but I don't know where he go. I mean, unless. PSG, you know, do keep him and they totally sort of change the dynamic at that club. Um, you know, you never know, maybe with Mbappe going, uh, what happens with Lionel Messi, you know, there is a potential that they could, you know, think actually we'll, we'll just back Pochettino in the way that he wants to have his team perform. 
the alternative, I suppose, is Real Madrid. You know, they've been sort of knocking a few times. You know, clearly uh, Zinedine Zidane isn't going to go back there, right? You know, he's 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 looking like the one that's going to be potentially in at PSG. And we all saw sort of Real Madrid last night. They, they got through against Chelsea, so you kind of think Carlo Ancelotti is safe, you know, as long as that run goes on. But you know, they've sacked him before, haven't they? After he's won the Champions League, so it's always a precarious situation. And they they did look down and out at one point last night. So you know, maybe that's an alternative route. But it is a fascinating one that he's. I mean, he'll he'll never manage United now, surely, will he, Pochettino? I mean, that that that's done now. It doesn't look like it. No, it doesn't no. look like it, does it? Remarkable. I'd say never, never say never in football because the, the, it can turn quite quickly. Uh, Pochettino had some serious backers at Manchester United, but I sense in the last month that it was, the mood was just going against him. You've got these intangibles and, and it just was. I think he had his moment among a lot of fans and it wasn't this time. I, I spoke to a big agent on Saturday and he said, Andy, what on earth are United doing? Poch is absolutely the man. He said, Andy, did you see what he did at Tottenham? And listen to me properly, Andy. He took Tottenham to the Champions League final on a limited budget. He improved them year after year. And he's entitled to that opinion. Now, at the moment, nobody wants to hear that because we've got bright new manager, shiny new manager syndrome, and everything's going to be great. But in the, in the passage of time, he might go somewhere. He might prove that he's a good manager. He might even win something. And then his stock will rise again. And he's still relatively young. I think all four of the managers United were were looking at were all aged between 50 and 55. So they've all got life uh, in them at the moment. It's sad for Poch. He wanted to manage Manchester United, but he's not the only one. Antonio Conte wanted to manage Manchester United as well. I think a lot of people would like to manage Manchester United. But Tenag is, uh, is the right man in the right place at the right moment. Let's just reflect on a minute then what this means for the rest of Manchester United's season, starting with Norwich at the weekend. Andy, you alluded to it earlier on in the podcast. This should give everyone a lift, shouldn't it? The last two games have been miserable. There's been a real sense of drift about these matches like we've spoken about. This could inject something for the weekend that means we're not going to be bored to tears. Please say that it will inject something. Well, yeah, Manchester United should should be beating Norwich at Old Trafford, but we were this, this is about Manchester Everton. United. Exactly. I take your point how this should lift everyone. On the contrary, if Norwich were to win at Old Trafford, I think that crowd would turn mutinous. There's already talk of protest in the air. Fans are unhappy and with good reason um, going into the game. I think that the Ten Hag stuff will lift the mood slightly. But United will always be judged by primarily by, by the results. I think the best case scenario is the team... Finished the season strongly, but been saying this since the second week of the season. <laughs> They've still not managed to put a decent run run together. Uh, we're, we're scraping the barrel now, aren't we? You know, if if Victor Lindelof has a really good final six matches, then we'll be, we'll be saying, you know, this is good. And it brings me back to something a Liverpool journalist said to me a few years ago. He said, "I can't tell you how many times I wrote that Joe Allen's a good player, and you're basically scraping the barrel." He said. You're kidding yourself in many ways. I said, now I can laugh about it because we've got a genuinely good team and we've got to find angles between now and the end of the season while all the time watching United's main rivals doing it for real. Andy, Fred is a good player. I don't know what you mean. But, well, it, it, Fred's having a really good time you know, and, and hopefully he can continue that and become an important part of Ten go. Hag's plans. So, yes, yeah, like- I'm up. I'm all for optimism, mate. I'm an optimistic person. I've just been ground down and defeated by Manchester United. That's not that's not me. <laughs> I feel like I want to good player, just like Joe Allen was I, I, for Liverpool. Yeah, you know. I feel like I so, want to stick up for Joe Allen. I've watched him plenty of times for Wales. You're a you're a 2016 semi finalist. United's midfield at that time wasn't reaching that levels. I, I think that Liverpool um, journalist <laughs> he, he wasn't having a go at Joe Allen. I can't believe this podcast now talking about Joe Allen, <laughs> but. He was just trying to find positive. So it was a positive when he was writing about him. But when you're yeah. finishing seventh and eighth and you're a club like, like Liverpool, that ain't good enough Isn't either. Is saying about polishing no. something? Yes, there, there is. is we've, yeah. u- we've, we've, used it, we've used it several <laughs> times on this podcast this year. 
One final point then. Ralph Rangnick, Laurie. Obviously, still the interim manager. No matter what happens with Ten Hag, I'm sure he'll remain the interim manager until the end of this campaign. The question, obviously, refocusing on what happens next for him. Ten Hag feels more like someone who is aligned with the thinking that Rangnick may have had for the club from some of the reports that's come out. What do you think this means for his his future relationship, shall we put it, with the club? Yeah, it will be interesting. I wonder if Eric Ten Hag will have a conversation with him. I'm sure he will, you know. Um, Ralph Rannick had a conversation with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, didn't he, when he came in and, and kind of picked his brain. So I'm sure that'll happen. Um, the extent to which Ralph Rannick is kind of formally involved in Manchester United, though, is still to be determined. I mean, I, I get the impression that the consultancy really will be a case of, you know, picking his brains as and when, and maybe if, you know, he's got a good contact with an agent or a player, you know, they, they can ask and, and, you know, he can perhaps help in that situation. I don't think it's going to be a kind of, you know, overarching director of football kind of style role. It'll be a, an advisory capacity. Um, you know, for example, this process with the new manager, he wasn't consulted in terms of who should we go for, what what, what should we do. More, more recently, you know, I think he's been updated on, you know, talks and, and how they've gone, but not necessarily the finer details at all. Um, so it's it's kind of been arm's length for him in, in this time. Um, and I, I kind of guess that, you know, they'll, they'll sit down, won't they? And they'll, they'll try and thrash out exactly what it'll look like coming into the season. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's, a, a, you know, the same kind of way that this has been handled. When Ralph Rangnick came in, he talked jokingly, um, but also seriously about anointing a successor as if he would have the power to do that. And I believe he would have had the power in his mind when he said that in, in December. That didn't happen. That shows you the influence of Ralph Rangnick at Old Trafford. It is a decreasing one, not an increasing one. If Ten Hag comes in and says, he's a man, he, I'll be the sorcerer, I'll be the apprentice to this sorcerer, that will affect it again. But there's already a structure in place with John Murta, with Darren Fletcher. So I, I'm not overly optimistic from Ralph Rangnick's perspective about how much of an influence he will have with Manchester United's first team. Maybe in other areas of the club, he can have more of an influence. Yeah, definitely something to keep an eye on between now and the end of this campaign. And keep your eye on The Athletic as well for all the very latest analysis and news on Manchester United choosing Eric Ten Hag to be the new manager. If you're not a subscriber, don't forget that offer. You can subscribe to The Athletic for just £1 a month for the first six months. Just go to theathletic.com forward slash Man United pod. Andy, thank you for getting up early after your late night at the Bernabeu last night. And Laurie, thank you for joining us as well. Thank you all for listening too. It was an earlier than usual talk of the Devils. I hope you think it was worth it. We'll be back after the Norwich game. See you after that. Bye-bye.